All right. Hello, everybody. We are finally here with Rachel Rosenketter, the creator of the deck that we have been speaking about so much in our group, the Rainbow Heart Tarot. Oh, Rachel, thank you for coming and taking the time to talk with me. I'm really, really excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so I do have a list of questions, and then I know that there's some stuff that we're just going to kind of spitball at the end. Mm -hmm. So I guess we'll just jump right in. I've got my deck here for reference with specific cards and my questions. Um, if that's okay. Hey. I've got them laid out here. Um, so the first question that I've got, and I've got a couple cards that show it. So the texture, this on um, the metallic kind of paints on, on the cards, they have, it's hard to tell on video, but they have that texture underneath. And I know, I know that they were painted on canvas originally, right? Um, actually watercolor paper. Okay. Watercolor. Uh, watercolor paper. Mm -hmm. So is that is that texture just kind of because the metallics, the way that they're painted, is it just, is that the watercolor paper we're seeing through that? Or is that a technique you used? Yeah, it's the, it's the natural grain of the watercolor paper. It's a 300 pound cold pressed paper. And then the metallic paints that I've been using are just these acrylic gouache metallic paints. Oh, cool. um, yeah, so they make them in, you know, a variety of different colors and the way that the paint settles into the grain of the paper just gives it that really nice um, texture and kind of a little bit of a reflective quality. And I was actually really pleased with how, um, how it came out looking when the cards were printed because sometimes you never know uh, how something that you've created in real life is going to translate once it's you know scanned and the file type has changed and then printed in a different medium. Yeah, I love, I love that it's not everything, that, that it's just those details that you would want to sparkle, like her hair, the stars. Um, mm -hmm. On the Knight of Swords, it's, it's like his helmet, his links, his sword, like very specific things that are metallic. And so I figured it was probably intentional and I love it. I well, thank you. For sure. Um, so out of all the cards in the deck, which card was it that took you the longest to make? Yeah, so I would say that in general, the cards that I painted first or more towards the beginning of the deck took me a little bit longer. And that's because I was still kind of figuring out, feeling out like the voice and style of the deck. Um, but there were several cards that I ended up painting multiple iterations of, and those were definitely the ones that ended up taking the longest. Um, Judgment is one example, and it wasn't a matter so much of me being super unhappy with the first iteration of the card. I just kept having a better idea, um, a, a better idea of how the card could be, and um, it actually was a little bit dangerous because I reached a point where I realized that I could just keep repainting the cards forever. <laughs> and then <laughs> and never, never finish. <laughs> out with the deck. Um, yeah. so at some point I had to, I had to like, you know, choose a somewhat arbitrary stopping point um, and say, these are beautiful. Don't just keep doing different iterations of them forever. <laughs> I definitely can understand that. Like, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the card. Um, oh, here it is. I can definitely understand why it would be a card that would take a while, but I mean, you, you've nailed it. Mm, thank you. Nailed it. And I love the gradient. I was mentioning this in my uh, last little live that I did yesterday in the group, but I love that the, the transition here from the black sky with the stars into, into the sun. I don't know if you've if you intended it as a sunrise or sunset or if that's like open to whatever but I love that there's a transition from day to night oh thank you yeah that was actually one of the um things that changed in the final iteration of that card was was that transition all the way from like you said either the sunrise or the sunset to the like the starry black night sky um and having both of those things kind of like live in the same visual field it's, it's, it, there's so much depth and it's, 
literally looking at it, like most of the deck, that's one thing I've noticed is it's it's simple artwork, maybe not to lay out, but it's not, you know, it's not uh, a collage deck. So it's not like, you know, this piece, this piece, this piece, and your eye is drawn, you know, six different ways. But at the same time, there's so much in it. So I don't mm. you've captured that. Thank you. I feel like. Yeah, something I was um, really intentional about in creating the deck was the original paintings are actually quite small. They're not that much larger than the cards themselves. Really? And I did that because I wanted to make sure that all of the detail read really well when it was shrunk down just a little bit to the actual size of the cards. And that's something that you do see too. Like people create it on a, you know, bigger than five by seven, they'll put it on a piece of paper and then draw it down. And you hear so many people say, you know, I wish the cards were bigger because I know that there's detail here and I could see yeah, it. Yeah, it gets lost. That's smart, smart, smart. Thank you. So the card that I'm sure you hear about a lot, um, the moon. Uh-huh. Fantastic. I, Thank you. I know that that's a card that some people might just kind of be like almost confronted by. And I think, mm -hmm. I think that's why it's amazing. But can we dive just a little bit into that? Like how, I, cause I've never seen a depiction or an inclusion of that particular motif into the moon card. Sure. So did you, how did you come to do that? Yeah, so I was really wanting to make this kind of connection between the cycles of the moon and the cycles of people with vulvas and the way that those align naturally. Um, and so I also just wanted to have this like positive and powerful depiction of a vulva um, just because I think it's still somewhat taboo, um, yeah. even in something like a tarot deck, even in this magical tool. And um, yeah, and to me, the moon is all about mystery, the divine feminine, darkness, the unconscious. And I just thought that that was kind of a beautiful symbol to layer in um, with the rest of the imagery. But that being said, I've also gotten some feedback from folks that this depiction of the moon isn't super trans inclusive. And so that might be my one um, qualm or regret with that particular card. Interesting you say that because I yeah. wouldn't have, I wouldn't have felt that way. But I mean, of course, that's what sure. tarot is, right? It's all about interpretation. Right. So. And it certainly wasn't my um, certainly wasn't my intention to um, make it feel exclusive to anyone. Yeah, but I understand if folks read it that way. I mean, is there? Do you think that the moon? Because this is another thing that I touched on. Like the moon really is. It does carry a, you know, to label. It does carry hash, you know, feminine energy sure and that i mean that doesn't necessarily mean you know just like you said uh you know physicality wise so i'm i'm curious as to i'm, I'm curious as to how else it should have been interpreted i guess sure I mean, that's yeah, I think, me. Again, that's I think that them. maybe it was being read in a, a more literal way Whereas I was intending it at least in a more um, kind of symbolic or metaphorical sense. Okay, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's definitely what I got because you still have too, you've got, you know, the water and the, the crayfish lobster creature coming out of the depth. Mm -hmm. Still got the domesticated dog and the wild wolf. You've, you know, you've got the columns, the pyramids and the columns on either side. So it's still very traditional too. So I like how you tied both in. I just, I love the card, but I figured that that was a whole lot of discussion about. <laughs> yeah, it's been a controversial one. <laughs> but hey, what does controversy spark if not conversation, right? And right. elevation of, you know, elevation of our beings, which again, that's what tarot is for. Yeah, so. absolutely. Okay, so kind of going along the same lines, the Empress card. I think I have to look up the name, but... um. Uh, 
what was it? I, I looked it up and it was Artemis of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of appears as, you know, um, many breasts, but in, sure. in the little bit of research that I did about it, like it's actually a very historical depiction that existed in, in you know, like stonework and statues. And some yeah. people say that they were actually designed to be representative of testicles. And some say that they were supposed to be gourds because the Empress is all about, uh, you know, fertility, abundance, harvest, mm -hmm. uh, reaping what you sow kind of deal. Yeah. How how were you taking this card when you chose to depict it this way instead of just the classic woman on the throne that we kind of see? Yeah, I think you you hit the nail on the head um, talking about the abundance and the fertility that the empress represents. And I think regardless of whether they're interpreted as breasts or gourds or um, testicles, those are all these kind of um, symbols of fecundity and fertility. And um, yeah, I just really wanted to get across this feeling of muchness. And it's like, she's this representation of this generous mother that kind of always has milk to give, always has wheat. Um, all these different symbols are folded in, um, sort of pointing to that. and. I also just, I've, all, I've always personally felt that the depiction of the empress in the white dress with the roses, very beautiful. Of course, I, I mean, I love the classical image, but at the same time, I always felt that it was like, maybe just a little bit prudish. Yeah. Or the depiction of this archetype who's like the mother of all. Yeah, that that raw kind of natural energy. Like that's one thing that I always view in tarot decks. Some people are like, oh, they're they're naked. Why is there so many breasts and why are there, you know, why are there male penises in this deck? And it's like, because the human body is the raw essence of what we are now. Yeah. So I totally get that. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So next question, your 10 of swords card, such an interesting image. Again, it's, it's traditional and yet it's not, you've got the classic, you know, being on the ground with the ten of ten mm -hmm. piercing there's the tiny little uh you know skyline with sun coming in like this this isn't the end it is but it isn't it's kind of you know and then if you cover it it looks to me i mean it's two different halves it's like this one is almost sleeping and just comfortable with the way that it is maybe and then mm -hmm. this person is just completely terrified <laughs> right scared so is that was that just another attempt on on your behalf to kind of pull that duality into where it's whatever the reader whichever half the reader needs at the mm. yeah with this card my intention was really to capture the um emotional experience of feeling shattered or feeling torn apart, feeling betrayed, and the way that that can create a kind of sense of split in the self um, when someone is going through a really dark night of the soul. And um, so to me, one half of the figure, the gray half, is this kind of grief or sorrow. And then the, the darker half of the figure is this kind of um, sense of horror or this kind of nightmarish quality and so i wanted to capture the way that the kinds of experiences that really rock us to our core can really have both qualities that yeah okay that makes sense i love anytime that anybody gets a ten of swords in their reading they're always like oh no when am i dying it's like it's right <laughs> <laughs> not what that means but it's always kind of a card associated with dread so I, I yeah yeah how do there's a lot of hope in that card too though it's like it's always darkest before the dawn kind of a card that's that's like the mantra that I've always applied to the ten of swords like when uh -huh. I was learning I was like that's that's what I've always carried with it is it's is is it really the end though I mean are, right are you a little bit too much in your feels like are you being a tad bit dramatic right 
Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's a card that's about the fear that it is the end, you know? And the fact that it may or may not really be. Right. Right. Okay, cool. See, I'm loving that I'm actually getting to ask you like specific questions because as soon as I went through the deck, I was like, oh, I wonder about this. And then once you so graciously agreed to talk to me, I was like, I finally get to know, I'm excited. Um, okay, so next question, the strength card. Mm -hmm. I love, again, it is it is the traditional imagery that we see with the, the woman and the lion. However, I was really interested in your depiction because normally you see the woman like petting the lion or just kind of not even looking at the lion, you know, a hand around the mane or, uh -huh. you know, the lion being calm. I mean, in some decks you see the woman kind of like prying open the mouth, but even then the lion looks like a little bit more complacent, I guess. Sure. This is interesting because the lion, he looks a little bit more fierce than we usually see. And she looks a little bit more scared. Hmm. So how did, uh, what, what were you feeling here when you created this card? Sure, yeah. I was really wanting to create a depiction of strength that would serve as a little bit of a counterbalance to a lot of the other images of strength we see that seem to almost be, to me at least, about some sort of control or assertion of power over our more um, animal instincts. And so I wanted to create a depiction of strength that was more about some of the power that lies in vulnerability um, or in the relinquishing of control and sort of embracing and listening to our more animal desires and recognizing them as really valid. I like that. So it's kind of more accepting the fact that maybe you aren't so in control, but learning how to work with it in a sense, instead yeah. of overpowering it and just being like, no, like you're going to do what I say. It's a little bit more exactly. than I guess then. Okay. I love that. I love that. Um, so overall, just a couple last general questions here. Like I said, sure. this, to me just feels really friendly and warm, but very, um, very straightforward still. It, mm -hmm. is, it is a gentle hug in that it'll be like, yeah, you know, I, I know you're walking through some stuff. I'll lay it out for you. It's not necessarily like, but it'll all be okay. Like it, it does tell you how it is, but it is very clear. Mm -hmm. um, so that's at least the voice that I get from it. Is that kind of the voice that you were going for? Or did you have something like how, how, how did you intend for it to speak to the people who read with it? Sure. Yeah, I was really wanting to create a deck that was super accessible. I kind of wanted to make a deck that anybody would be able to pick up regardless of their familiarity with the tarot and be able to understand just almost immediately um, what the cards were trying to communicate. Um, and in some cases, that's little decisions like most of my wands card have an actual depiction of fire in the mm -hmm. card. Um, because I know for myself, when I started reading, it actually took me a while to make that connection between the wands and that really um, kind of intense, fiery, creative energy. And so just little decisions like that, trying to um, drive home connections even harder. And I just really wanted to create a deck that was accessible, but also really layered with symbolism for people who are diehard tarot practitioners um, and familiar with the history and the lineage. And um, yeah, I'm really glad that it comes across to you as uh, warm in that way, because I sort of wanted it, the voice of the deck to be, you know, this, this gentle and loving friend who will comfort you in your worst moments and celebrate with you in your best moments, but also tell you like, hey girl, you need to get out of this relationship yeah. <laughs> or whatever it may be. You yeah, know. that friend that tells you like it is for sure. Yeah. It's so valuable too, because it's like, you know, you don't, you hear a lot about um, nice coated decks or mm. whatever the term is. I'm not using the correct one, but uh, sure. nice washed decks, I think actually uh -huh. the original thing. 
where it's like, it's only kindness and it doesn't really get you through the tough things because it doesn't really go there with it. Yeah. So I love that you were able to bring all of that in. Like one of my, one of my other favorite cards in this deck was your eight of wands Mm. does capture again, the traditional symbolism, but it's, you know, usually you just see wands flying through the air and these are flaming arrows, which is perfect, not only for the fire energy of the suit of wands, but it's like a lot's coming at you quickly and it will burn out. Like it, it's right. going to last forever. Like, you know, it's, yeah. it, and it really hits on that speed and that intensity that, that that brings. So I love that. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think, let me see. I'm pretty sure that was all that I had. Um, yeah, I think, I think those are the main questions that I had for you. So let's just, let's just chit chat. What else have you got going on these days? Yeah, I, something I wanted to mention for all of your viewers is that I'm going to be teaching a class in January fully online. It's a four week class called Working with the Tarot. And it's really just a class for beginners or for people who are interested in really deepening the relationship with the cards. Um, And so, yeah, a four week class and I'm really excited about it. And I can send you the link and stuff in case anybody is curious about signing up. Absolutely. Please do. Yeah, I would love to do it myself. That sounds really neat because you don't really find like when I'm going to deep dive into a deck, I need some kind of structure to hold on to because it's, you know, deep dive is such like a loose term so that it would sure. have some sort of like, okay, we're going to do this and then this. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that'll really help. I will be teaching the class with my own deck with the Rainbow Heart Tarot, nice. but really um, you can work with any kind of 78 card, more or less traditional deck. You don't need to you don't need to take the class with my deck. Okay. To That's be able to follow along. That'll be really exciting. Do you have yeah. any more ideas for decks that are coming out? I know we're just finished with this one, but I'm already sure. like more. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually something else I wanted to mention. Um, and I haven't posted about this on social media anywhere. I've been pretty private about it, but I'm actually in the process of illustrating an Oracle deck Um, It will be a 64 card deck, really very similar stylistically to the Rainbow Heart Tarot, but um, a little bit darker and a little bit even more psychedelic than this deck. You had me at darker. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. So, so, I mean, it's going to take me a while to create all of those paintings, um, but I expect it to be coming out early 2022. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. That'll be, that'll be really great. I can't wait to see, I can't wait to see what you start working on. That'll be amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I'm excited. I'll, I'll start, I'll probably start posting stuff on social media once I've made a little bit more progress and feel just a little bit further along with the project. For sure. Yeah. You want, you want your feet a little bit on the ground with it before you talk about it. I, I get it. Yeah. I will link as well Rachel's uh, social media and accounts in the, I'm going to be such a YouTuber, in the description below. Um, But in the description of this video, I'll have all the links to Rachel's stuff that you can grab as well. Um, Any final thoughts, Rachel? Anything that you would like to leave us with? Any advice or uh, parting statements about your deck that we can have? Sure. Um, I'll leave with one piece of advice and one parting statement. So something that I wish somebody would have told me when I started reading tarot is to always make sure that you get yourself centered and get yourself into this really kind of grounded and connected state before you do a reading, because otherwise you end up just reflecting your own chaos or desperation back at yourself. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe that's an obvious um, piece of advice, but I would have found it helpful if someone would have told me that a few years ago. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then 
other than that, I just want to wish everyone who's working with the deck um, blessings, and I hope that you find all the things that your heart is longing for, and I hope that this can be really a companion for you on your path to self-love and self-knowledge. I love that. Rachel, I just adore you. Thank you again for taking the time to talk to me and answer some questions and kind of get uh, get your deck out there some more. I really, I have been chatting this thing up like crazy and I hope you nothing but success in, with this deck and everything else that you work on. I think I think you're wonderful and you're such a, a powerful, powerful force and you've really created something incredible here. So thank, oh, thank you. So you. You're going to make me blush. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, maybe we can reconnect with your next deck. I can't I would love that. fill you with questions about the next stuff that comes out. And you've got a fan forever in me just saying. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that is it with this video. So we will talk to you later.